One. All up, all the way. House all the way up. I'm blind and old. Thank you. Okay, so I just got to tell you the story. I got a text a little while ago from Kyle. Kyle and Jamie went to Chicago for a wedding. Jamie's best friend's getting married, so they went over to the Catholic Church today, and they had the wedding, and as soon as they got done, they all went outside, and Kyle went outside, and he texted me. He's like, dude, this is so cool. The wedding is over. The priest came out and lit up a smoke. It was just awesome. <laughs> it was cool. I just, you know, that was neat. Um, this, uh, it's been an interesting day. Everyone, did anyone, everyone have a good day today? Anyone have a good day? Anyone have a good day? Anyone have a really, really bad day? Anyone? I had, um, I had a, I don't want to say humiliating, but there's, there's something about humility in it. Um, so I wrote this book, right? So the other day, I'm sitting here, and I don't like this, but I'm sitting, I gave out some of the books to the people in the band and they asked me to sign them. Okay, so that can make a person's head swell. Would you agree? Like, that could, right? That could make a person's head swell. So, so I'm feeling pretty good about myself, right? But God has a way of making sure that you get down off of your horse in a hurry. So this morning, um, I'm in the shower, not to be graphic, don't imagine this, but I'm in the shower, and Jameson's in the tub next to me. She's, I, we have, you know, there's a tub and then there's a shower, and so she's in there in, in this much water, and I am petrified of water. I just want to let you know that so that the, you guys can play jokes on me now. Okay, look at Mary, already working it. She's like, right, so I'm petrified of water. So just because she's in this much water, I'm already scared. And so she's there, and I'm in the shower, and Meredith is on the bed with Jackson, and so she's kind of busy, and all of a sudden I heard kind of a, 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 a loud splash, like she kind of fell in the tub a little bit, and then I heard Meredith say, are you okay? And so I instantly just, I'm Superman, right? At this point, I want to rescue my little girl. So I, I throw the shower door open. It's one of those see-through, you know, like, you know, you know foggy. And I, and I jump out to save my daughter, and I hit the ground, and I slip, and it's like, Ooh! And I'm th it's amazing like this, but in that time, I'm thinking, okay, Lord, what's going to break? What part of me is going to bust? And all of a sudden, there I am, this famous, loved author, completely naked, totally on my rear end, shoved into the corner under the toilet with my feet up, <laughs> naked. So that's just, that was my day. So I just thought we'd just get that right out of the gate. That was done, and I'm a total loser, and... I'm sorry for even being here. Okay, so here's some announcements for you. Dan is running late, so I'm filling in for him, and he is awesome, and I can't fill in his shoes because they're literally that big. And so, so let me just tell you that Monday night we have our dinner, and um, I threw out there on Facebook that we should have a theme, and Jessica was really creative. She said we should do food. And so that's what we're going to do on our dinner. So Monday night, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a pathetic clap. If you're going to do it, let's go in, Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, so please, like, it's, it's Labor Day, you know, like, so that's what you're supposed to do, right? Eat. So that's what we'll do. We'll come and eat. So we'll have a potluck, and let's just, let's go all in on food. Let's just bring a lot of it and feed our faces and, and be happy, fat and happy. Um, as many of you know, uh, Ryan's going to be taking off on Monday, so we're going to like, you guys already started to participate in the, have the party for Ryan thing, but we'll continue on with that after we get done, so we'll go back there, we'll have some cake, we'll have some food, and uh, we'll hang out with Ryan, and, uh, and we'll just say our goodbyes. He's going to be leaving for how long are you going to be gone for? Pay attention, soldier. How long? Three months. So, so Katie's going to do some crying, and so we have to be there for Katie, so bring your tissues, okay? Okay. Um, all right, so there's that. Um, I just wanted to, who has, a, uh, who has a smartphone with a Facebook app? Who, who does? Okay, I want you to put your Facebook up, okay? Bring it up, bring it up, bring it up, because I, wanted, I want you guys to do a little check-in here. Do a little check-in, because I want you to, to let the world know that there's something other than going out on, on Saturday night and getting hammered, that there's another option available, so you just go ahead and do a little check-in here that you're at Revolution, and let everyone know that that's what you're, you've chosen to do and give them the option. They might not even know that there's an option. They might not know that there's something to do that was different than, than the norm on Saturday night because they're thinking it's church and the church is on Sunday, right? So maybe if they knew there was something here on Saturday, they would maybe come. So um, let's just go ahead and do that. Now, while you're doing that, 
I have. Oh, she was fine. Yeah, she's fine. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I, it was like Kramer, you know. It was just like, Whoa, you know. It was, it was cool. But now, and my wife was so scared, but now she just laughs at me. So that was cool. I don't, uh, yeah, exactly. Falling, I can't get up. Okay, so here's, here's one. You know, Dan's been asking for announcements, and you guys, and, and Paul said he likes bacon and all that kind of stuff. So um, this is a very, very serious one, and, I, and no joke. Um, you know, um, Jimmy and Mandy have a serious problem. They do have a very, very large problem. Would you care to stand up and show everybody your problem? <laughs> Guess what it is. Yeah, yeah. You just, yeah, right. They're, they have a serious, they have an illness. But we want to enable them. Because that's what we do. No, so here's the thing. Like a lot of people will blow off church to watch a game. You know that? They really would. Boo, 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 boo. But they won't. They won't, right? They're here, right? But yeah, their only request is that you do not talk about the Gator game while we're here. Because if you spoil the Gator game for them so that they know what's happening before they go home, they might not come anymore. <laughs> okay? So no Gator talk while we're here. So if you are on your phones and you're getting Gator updates, Pete... Um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> if, you're getting, if you're getting Gator updates, keep it to yourself, okay? Keep it to yourself. What's that? No one cares about them. Okay. <laughs> I love you, Jimmy. Nobody cares about the Seminoles anyway, do they? <laughs> Who cares? All right. Let's do this. Let's open up our Bibles to uh, Romans chapter 6. And if you have a Bible, go ahead and please open it. If you do not have a Bible or you don't have a device or whatever that you can get your Bible on, there are Bibles all over the place in here. There's uh, orange ones. There's yellow ones. And the page numbers that correspond with what I'm going to be sharing with you will be up on the screen for much of the verses, not all but some. And so uh, I figured if you have your own Bible, you know how to find that stuff. But if you're using this one, you need a little help. But if you need a Bible and you want to use one tonight, just go ahead and take that thing home with you. It's our gift to you. Please use it. So our main text will be in Romans chapter 6, uh, verses 1 through 23. I'm actually going to read that section of Scripture um, before we jump into the meat of the evening. But... I just want to kind of back up a little bit. We've, we started the study of the book of Romans because uh, Paul was trying to write to this group of mixed bags. It was a mixed bag of people. There was some Jews, there was some Gentiles, people coming into this church in Rome. And he's trying to get them all straight online with this Christianity thing so they can kind of get rid of their own opinions and go, okay, this is really what Christianity is, so we're all on the same page. And I hope that it's been helpful to you guys. I know it's been helpful to me. And here in Central Florida, we're kind of like it was in Rome. In, in Rome, there's all kinds of different people. And here in Central Florida, there's all kinds of different people from different parts of the country, if not the world, and so it's very appropriate for us too, because we have our own opinions on what the gospel really is. We have our own opinions on what we think church and Christianity and the Bible and all that kind of stuff. We have our opinions, and so Paul addresses a lot of these things in the book of Romans. We all realized uh, at the beginning when we started this book uh, that we're all we're all responding poorly. Like he said that, that God created everything and, and no one is with excuse. You can go out there and you can see everything that he's done and you know that there's a God and the problem is that everyone is suppressing the truth in their wickedness. And so they don't acknowledge this creator. They don't respond and worship the right way, the way he wants us to, to worship him. And so it's across the board. Uh, then we go on in, in the book of Romans and we see that there's various responses that, and they're poor, but goes into some of them, um, some of the major ones, some of the popular ones, like some of the laws and the rules that the Jewish people were holding on to. And then, of course, there's the subjective conscience that everyone's trying to follow to see kind of who does right and who does not. But at the end of the day, it's an effort to try to be good enough so that God will approve of you and let you into his heaven. And so that's what people do. And so what it says here in Romans chapter 3, we got to that, and it just basically says, you know what, all that stuff you were thinking, no. 
It says that no one is good, that no one is seeking God, okay? That no one is righteous, not even one. It says that all people, no matter where you are, no matter what religion you come from, what family you come from, what country, what time period, every single person is guilty before God. And we're guilty because of our active sins, the things that we actually do that are, that are an affront to God, but also because of our passive sin nature that's been handed down to us from Adam and Eve, right? Generation, generation, DNA. You know what I'm saying? It's all, it's in our blood, and so we can't get past it. So it tells us that all are sinners, and all of us fall short. But then it goes on to tell us that God makes a way. Even though there's this, that the gavel goes down and it says, listen, you're all guilty. But then it goes on to say, but God makes a way to get around that problem that you can't get past. And so that's the gospel. But see, you have to understand that all of this, all of this, the bad news of the fact that you can't get better, that's the gospel too. All of this is the gospel. The bad news of your, of your inability to, to fix your problem eternally and that God made a way, that's all part of the gospel. And he wants us to understand that, that God does make a way that the sacrifice of Jesus received by faith uh, purchases your acquittal. It purchases your acquittal. You are, all of us are guilty before God. We're all guilty, but Jesus Christ, that one sacrifice on the cross, the Bible says, purchases your acquittal so that when the Father looks at you, even though you brought to the cross nothing but sin and death, that he looks at you and says, oh, holy, blameless, and without a single fault. That's really, really good news. And we, we read on in uh, that section where we talked about Abraham recently, and he says 29 times in chapter 3 and 4, 29 times that we're just to believe that, that we're just to have faith in this Jesus, that his one sacrifice for your sin and mine is adequate, that that's all we need to conquer all sin, past, present, future, active sin and rebellion and passive sin that's just in your DNA. It's good for all of it. We just need to believe that and have faith in that alone. And that faith alone will put us in right relationship with God. But we also talked last week, which was really fun for me. We, we realize, I hope you all realize, that the gospel is not just for the lost people. That somehow it's just this evangelistic tool that you use to lead them down the Romans road so that they know that they that they know that they need Jesus and that they can go from lost to found and that that would end there. Because it doesn't end there. It's the, the Bible says in Romans that, it, that the gospel is the power of God saving, saving those who believe. There's a present tense there. And it's building, what we said last week, that it's building confidence and building joy in our salvation and in our Savior himself because he's given us a glimpse of the end. Remember, we saw the end of the movie. We know how it's all going to end. And so when things come our way, when, we, when the runner gets to mile 23 and he gets to the hill, he's not discouraged because he knows he's done 26 before. It's no big deal to do 23. I'm good. I've seen the end of the movie. And so I can, I can live through life staring down problem and saying, Jesus got this. He's had it before. He's had it before. He's had it before. He's got this now. That's joy. That's confidence. And that's hopefully where we stand. And so we see that the gospel is not just a one-time deal that leads the lost to be found, but it's an ongoing thing. And so that's why in Colossians, I think it's 2, six. As you accepted Christ, so walk in him. It's a continuous thing. He's continually saving you. He saved you, he's saving you, and he will save you at the very end. And that's the gospel. And this week, no exception, we see the continuation of the power of God working in us. It's not just that we were lost and going to hell and then he saved us and now we're heaven bound, but something is happening day to day in the lives of the believers. He doesn't just say, I'll save you, but he gives you some things. He gives you some promises. He gives you some tools and he changes who you are, your perspective, how you live life. And so that's what we see here in chapter six, the ongoing power of God to save. I want to read, I want to read this with you. You guys all there? Romans 6, 
I'm going to read the whole chapter. You ready? I know most of the time you don't get this, but this is good, this is good stuff, okay? It's good stuff. Romans 6. Here we go. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? Of course not. Don't you realize that you became the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Thank God. Once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteous living. Because of the weakness of your human nature, I am using the illustration of slavery to help you understand all this. Previously, you let yourselves be slaves to impurity and lawlessness, which led even deeper into sin. Now you must give yourselves to be slaves to righteous living so that you will become holy. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. And what was the result? You are now ashamed of the things you used to do, things that end in eternal doom. But now you are free from the power of sin and have become slaves of God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Whew. That was a long run. That was a long run. There's so much in this chapter. When I started reading it just a couple of weeks ago, I started wondering, where am I going to go with this? There's so much stuff. If, you're, if you study the Bible at all, if you have spent any time in the church, you know there is a hundred different things that we could talk about in this chapter. And, but here, here, this is what I told you a year and a half ago when we were over in the old building, when we were studying this, we were doing that study called Transform, the study of Peter's life. I told you that I, didn't, I wasn't born and raised in the church. And so what, what I've done since I became a Christian is I'm listening to, to all these different preachers and I'm listening to people. I'm, 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 I'm just checking out the church life. That's the life that I live. And so I'm just watching how things are working out. And I listen to what's being taught and I listen to what's being lived. I watch what's being lived, should I say. And, but I don't have a lot of church experience behind me. So I don't, I don't, I'm not buying in on any program. You know what I'm saying? Like when I got saved, I just picked up a Bible and I started reading it. And so what I promised I would do with you guys is I, something I will continue to do, and that is this. I will read, and when I get to a place where what I read 
is like a crash course with what I'm seeing going on in the church or what I hear being taught, and I'm like, wait a minute. That's not what the Bible says. You know, like, there's things in Scripture, like, you can't just ignore them. You've got to do something with them. You can't just go, oh, well, that's what's been taught, so no big deal. Like, so when I get to a place in the Scripture where all of a sudden biblical truth and the way Christians are living are smash, crash, that's where I'm going to pause. And I'm going to venture into that and dig out some truth, and that's what I want to share with you. And so that's what I'm going to do here tonight. So there's all kinds of things that we could talk about, and if I miss your topic, sorry. This is the topic that we're going to do, okay? Let's just, let's just start. I'm going to call this thing Eight Deaths. I don't usually uh, name sermons, but it's, it's called Eight Deaths. So let's just start here. Just to, just, this is the spot, okay? I, I'm reading this, this, this Romans chapter 6, and I'm going, you know what? I, I, I don't, this isn't even just a word. This is not words in a page to me. Like, I live that life. So, like, I, I, can, I can, this is a voice of experience. Someone who was living, like, total rebellion against God didn't do anything right, you know? So I was a total enemy of God. Like, he was pushing in on me, and, and he wanted his way, and I was doing things my way, and I thought that I was just, this, this is the way I was going to be. And I didn't care what he thought. I wasn't even thinking about God. Like, I knew that he exists. I grew up going to temple, so I knew there was a God, but I didn't care about his moral standards. I didn't care about his commandments. I knew they existed, but I didn't care. Like, I didn't wake up in the morning trying to figure out ways to please Jesus and, like, be this nice little altar boy, well-behaved, little don't drink, don't smoke, don't cuss, little proper boy. I didn't have that, nor did I even give a rip about God because there's things that are way more important than, you know, behavior modification. Like, I didn't know anything about Jesus, about, about going to serve him or going to share him with people. I was just doing my own thing. So when I read, like, in Colossians 1.21, it says that we were far away from God because of our, our, our thoughts and actions, that we were his enemies, right? I, I get that. And I don't know if you guys have ever felt that before, but now when I look back, I can see that's who I was. In Romans 6.20, it, read, it said here that we were under no obligation to do what's right. I so lived that life. I so lived that life. I didn't give a rip. If I did something wrong, if I was doing anything immoral, I didn't care. Anyone ever been there? Right? Most of us. And if you're not raising your hand, you're probably there now because you're lying. I mean, everybody does this kind of stuff. We just, we know that we should do something, but we just don't care. Like, I'm going to do it. Like, all of us, Judd and I, my buddy Judd, we were talking about that, that so many of us know so much about this Bible. And like, why, like, this is crazy, but why even learn more when you won't even do what you already know? We're all guilty of it, right? We, we've been studying the Bible and studying the Bible, and still, we don't do what it says. So why learn more? So we could just be worse? <laughs> you know what I mean? It doesn't make any, that doesn't mean you should quit reading your Bible and quit coming to church. That wasn't your hall pass, okay? But I'm just saying, like, we're, we're all guilty of knowing that we should do something, but we just don't care. Let's just be honest. I was an absolute slave to sin because I chose it all the time. That was just who I was. I chose to do wrong. All of us are guilty of this. All of us. But the Bible says that eight deaths later, right? Eight deaths. You read this section right here. What's Paul's trying to like make a point? Death, you died, you died, you died, you were crucified, you died, you died. He's trying to get a point across that you're not the same person anymore. That when the Bible says that you died, it means that when you died, when you accepted Christ, that the old Charles died, like literally died, and he's a new creation in Christ. That the stuff he did before, doesn't even, don't even talk about it anymore. Because it doesn't exist, it never even happened, it's done. Do you understand that? So you're a new person. And so he's trying to, uh, like, get this into our heads that you're a new person because you literally died, that you no longer live, that the old Moses that chose sin, who was the enemy of God, who didn't care, I do care now. I do care now. And so what the Bible tells us here in Romans is that certain things happen. When we say yes to Jesus and we're a new creation, certain things happen. And this study is intended to give you some, 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 some um, correct information. Like, I want you to know 
what the gospel really is. Okay? And that's what is happening here in this chapter, okay? We need to understand. It says here, there's a couple things that happen as a result of the gospel. It says that we're free from the law. We're free from the requirements of the law. So we gotta, but we can't blaze by that. You gotta do something with that. That's a big thing, right? Like God wrote on tablets himself, said, this is my law, and now it's saying you're free from that. You can't just blow by. That's a big deal, right? You gotta do something with that. It also says that you're free from sin in, in 6, 7. So 6.15 is free from the requirements of the law. 6.7 says you're free from the power of sin. And so you've got to do something with those things. You've got to understand those things. Because if you don't understand those things, then your false impression of those things, when it fails, you, God failed you. Or, or so perceived. Do you understand? So we have to make some sense of all this. And this is where the church will divide. This, not, hopefully not here, but this is where you see different denominations take different roots and different churches split and they kind of argue and fight over some of this stuff. Romans is a, like a massive battleground within Christianity. And Romans 6 is like, if that's the battleground, this is the front lines. And we got to attack this thing and get some truth. We have to understand what the gospel really does. We don't want any false ideas of what the gospel does because then it will fail you. And then you'll get miserable. And then you'll blame God. And then you'll forget God. And you'll turn from God and run away. And we don't want that, right? So if you have a clear understanding of who God really is and what the gospel really is, you can embrace it and you can, you can utilize it for all the benefit that it's intended to give you. So let me ask you this, is, is, is if it says that we're free from the, from the, from the, from the uh, requirement of the law and we're free from sin, like there's no power over us anymore, is it just a free-for-all? Is it a free-for-all that we can just do whatever we want? Because listen, we are sinful people. And listen, I have heard it from people that we can do whatever we want because God's forgiven us past, present, future. They twist the gospel that God's forgiven us. And we got a connection. He knows me. He made me the way I am. We got a thing. And so it's a free for all, or so we assume. Because listen, we are broken people. And so we take something that is perfect and beautiful that God has made and we trash it. That's what we do. That's our normal pattern. We take food and we overeat. We take wine and we overdrink. We take sex and we oversex. We do everything wrong with everything. That's who we are. And so when the Bible says that we're free from the, from the uh, requirement of the law and we're free from the power of sin, that means we could do whatever we want and God will forgive. God will forgive. So when you read, look here, look, look at the chapter before, 521. What does it say? So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, and we're all in agreement there, right? Adam and Eve sin, sin rules over everyone. We're going to bring them to death. Everyone's going to die. So we, 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 we blanket it over everybody, right? So, but when it goes on and it says, but now God's wonderful grace rules instead. So that could kind of lead you down a bad road if you don't understand fully what the gospel is because when you read that, you're like, well, death was over everyone. Now grace is over everyone, so look, I'm good. I could do it. I said the prayer. I went to the altar. I took communion. Everything's good. He forgives me. He forgives me, so now I can do whatever I want. That's not true. That's not true. Maybe you don't need to keep the exact letter of the law anymore. But the Bible is quite clear that worship of God, it's still there. And, and worship of God is not just doing whatever pleases you. No, it's doing what pleases him. Let me share some scripture with you. Romans 7, 6 is jumping ahead, but you got to hear this. It says, now we can serve. Some translations will say worship. Either way, it's good. We can worship God not in the old way of obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way of living in the spirit. So he's saying that worship of God, doing it, you know, doing it God's way and acknowledging him as the king and you as his subject, it still exists. It's not gone. You can't just do whatever you want. He's still the king. You still have to worship him the way he wants, but now it's different. It's not just like keeping the law because you're afraid. Not keeping the law because you don't want to get busted. Not keeping the law because you want to lose your best cattle or your best goat. Living in fear and obligation. That's what we Jews do. 
But it's not like that anymore. Now it's like, no, it's something. It's in here, man. It's in here. Like you, you're not doing it because you're afraid of breaking the law and God's going to smite you with a lightning bolt from, from heaven because you misbehave. No, it's a little bit different. Now it's in the spirit. What does that mean? John um, 14, 21 says this. Those who accept and obey my commandments are the ones who love me. See, now we're getting somewhere. The reason why we worship God now is because we love him. It's not out of fear. It's not out of guilt. It's not out of, you need to dress this way. You need to give this much. You need to go to church. I love Jesus. I just want to do whatever you want me to do. I love you. Anyone ever been in love? Come on. Don't you just want to make your spouse happy? I mean, let's not over don't, don't over-spiritualize the Bible. I know it sounds crazy, right? But it's true. If you love your spouse, if you love your kids, don't you just want to do good by them? That's all it is. <laughs> just keep it simple, right? If you love someone, you make them happy. You'll do things that make them happy. Here's the thing, grace, we talk about this grace, and churches are just, I don't know what, I don't even know where all this stuff comes from. So like I said, I'm new. I'm only like 11, 12 years into Christianity. So a lot of you have been doing this longer than me. I don't understand this. The grace card. I, I, I just don't understand the grace card. I don't understand this grace, the, the grace, 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 grace. Like I understand what grace is. Grace is that I didn't earn it. I don't deserve it. And it's purely because Jesus loves me even though I'm a wretched, blatant, rebellious punk, but he loves me anyway. I mean, go down the list of the wretchedness of who you are, but he loves you anyways. His love for you that saves you. There's nothing to do with what you've done. Nothing to do with, with the style of your hair, the clothing you wear, what church you go to, or what church you don't go to. It's just because he loves you that you are saved. That's grace. Like you didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. You didn't even ask for it. That's grace. So grace is, is how and why you're forgiven and saved, but it's not a hall pass. People seem to think, and I don't get this thing, that grace is a hall pass. Grace is freedom to do as you want and that he'll forgive you anyway. I don't even understand that definition. It's sick and it's twisted, and I don't get it. Okay, so we got to understand what this whole grace thing is. All right, um, I, I, I'm going through my notes. This, and this is my stumbling block, like right here. I don't... I, I'm having trouble with this. I'm trying to say, I want to say something to you, but I don't know how to quite say it, so I'm going to do my best, but if I mess up, I'll say, etch a sketch, let's try this again, okay? The freedom that God's grace gives you, okay, that grace, that grace that, that purchased your free, that, that thing that he gave you because he loves you and now you're free, that is not the power behind you to not sin. It is not the power to relieve, uh, to, to help you obey his commands or follow Jesus. Okay? Th it's not. Okay? Love is the power. Love is the power behind your ability to no longer sin. Love is the power that makes you want to obey his commands. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? It's because of his great love shown to you that while you were a sinner, Christ died for you. Do you, do you understand that? It's the love, right? It's, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> I saw this. this I got to share this with you. His love for you is so insane. In, 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 in chapter 5, you don't have to go there if you don't want, but he's, he's, he's comparing his love for you versus your love for other people. So if you think you're a loving person, this is what he says. He says that, he starts talking about how someone might die for this person or might die for that person. So it says here, um, verse 6, which is beautiful, when we were utterly helpless, 5-6, um, Christ came at the right time and died for our sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person. So I think he's probably pretty on the, on the mark there, that most of us, 
even if it was someone who was a pretty good person, you still probably wouldn't die for them. I mean, let's just be honest. Like, let's not be high and holy and say, oh, no, I'm, I, like, please martyr me, Jesus. Like, you're not that guy, okay? No, no one really wants to die for someone who's an upright person. But then it goes on to say here, it says, um, though someone, he's trying to, he's like, there's someone out there might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. And I loved, I, don't, I didn't even read any other translations, but I love this might perhaps thing. It just shows you what we are. Like, it's saying like, let, do you know might and perhaps kind of like, it's, it's like kind of redundant. It's like might splits the, 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 the group in half. Like, here's a group of people. Someone out of this group might die for someone who's really awesome. Perhaps. <laughs> he, he, takes, he singles it down to one person, and then he says that in that one person, he's probably not even going to do it either. Like, most of us wouldn't even die for the most perfect, awesome person ever, is what he's saying. But yet, Jesus... He doesn't die for the most perfect, awesome person ever. He dies for his enemies, the ones who are in blatant rebellion against him. How many people want to sign up for that one? No one, right? No one. And that's what makes Jesus awesome, his love. And when you start to ponder that, and when that love hits its mark in your heart, and it begins to grow and grow, and you ponder that, you're only response is joyous obedience. When you start pondering the fact that you are in blatant rebellion since day one against the holy and perfect God, and he loves you still enough for the cross to be whipped, beaten, and killed for you, that just makes something happen inside of your heart, and you just respond to that love. He loved us, now I love you, let me serve you. That's good preaching, man. Come on. You gotta, yeah, that's what I'm saying. We've got to have one charismatic in here. Please. My goodness gracious. I'm sweating to death. Yeah. Woo. Listen, the point of this, this whole yell, <laughs> is that the power to obey God, the power to follow him, the, 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 the power behind wanting to obey his commands, the power to wanting to not sin anymore. It comes from a love for Jesus that is, that is, is birthed and, and, and fertilized and produced and increased in the quiet, contemplative moments alone thinking about financial stewardship. <laughs> th th thinking about tithing. Thinking about Spare the rod, spoil the child. <laughs> right? No, no, no. It's, it's when you are quiet and you're in that quiet, reflective place when you're just thinking about the gospel. That's when the love of Jesus swells up in your heart and causes you to change. When, when the utterly helpless is divinely healed. When, when the sinner gets to step aside and the sinless goes to the cross for you. That's crazy. When blatant rebellion is met with the open arms of loving adoption into the family. That's crazy. That's what I'm talking about. I mean, just think like he didn't need, this is God of the universe coming down and willingly, willingly saying, I'll die for them. I'll, I'll, I'll be tortured and die for you. How do you not love that guy? How, how, when you think about that, when you think about the gospel that, and you start thinking about all your list of the wretched disgusting things that you've done. It says in there all these things that you did. What did it do? It caused you to just be appalled by the things you used to do. And so you start thinking about these things. And I don't know about you, but I can see some of the stuff that I pulled, you know? Blatant rebellion against this God who loves me. And I start thinking about that, and I'm like, Kelly, if you ever did that stuff to me, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even say hello to you, dude. 
I mean, seriously. Man, if you did half the things I did to other people to me, I wouldn't want you to come to my church. I mean, I'm, let's just be honest. And God looks at me, a filthy, rotten thing, and says, yeah, I'd die for that guy. Who does that? Nobody does that. And when you start doing that, man, your heart just starts to swell. And you just, I just love Jesus, right? You just love Jesus. And I, and I, I just want to follow him, right? He loves me. He saved me. He told me to follow him. And here's a side note. Like, this is this extra. This is a bonus. Like a little P.S. He raised himself from the dead, like if, 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 seriously, if Jesus, it, who's, who's, whose mom is passed away? Raise your hand. Who's got a mom that's passed away? Okay, if she walked into the room right now and said, Frankie, I need you to go wash my car for me, do it. You know what I'm saying? Like when he says, when he raises himself from the dead and goes, yeah, by the way, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, yes, yes, sir. Yes. You want me to go make disciples? Yes, sir. You want me to follow you? Yes, sir. He rose himself from death, so I just want to follow that guy. So it's, it's just, it's good advice. Please take it. Okay, so now, so that it, it, the power to, to obey the commands of God, to follow him, it comes out of response of love. Do you understand? But the same is true for not sinning. And see, this is a, this is a tough one. Because Grace seems to be a hall pass for sin. And it's, and it's taught. I mean, I literally, listen, I'm not going to name a church. And I'm not going to name a person. But it was probably three to four, th- three years ago. Meredith and I were talking to this young lady that was attending another church. And, and, and this is insane, Okay. The pastor told her, supposedly, that God gave you this stuff. Go enjoy it. Don't pick one. Just go enjoy it. Grace. Like, what is that? I'm, we looked at each other like, I, are you kidding me? Like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Like, that was what she was told. And so, like, I was like, Oh no, sweetheart, please listen, 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 listen. So I'm like pulling out the Bible and I'm, I'm teaching all this stuff. And it's like we try to make an in on in course correction here, but that's what was being taught. Like, grace, grace, grace is not a hall pass to do whatever you want. Grace is what saved you from an eternal hell because He loves you, irregardless of how nasty and ugly you were. Like, that's what grace is. It's not just to do whatever you want. It says here twice, two awesome sections here in in Romans chapter 6, right at the beginning. Should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not, like with an exclamation point. There's not a whole lot of explanation points in the Bible. There's one there, and guess what? Keep reading on to verse 15, same thing. Well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? Of course not! Exclamation point! Like, you guys are missing the point here of grace. Grace is not a hall pass to do whatever you want. And I learned something this week as I was sitting there. I remember I told you I'm not a church guy, so I don't really know a whole lot of what, you know, what we've, what's been ingrained into certain denominational theology and doctrine. I just like read the Bible and I'm like, this is not what I've heard. This is not what is practiced. What is this, you know? Well, I've heard people preach about this section of Scripture before. Like, Should I keep doing more and more sin? Because if I sin more, then that just shows that God's grace is more. And everyone always says, no, 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 that's not what that means. It's not. But you know what? Yes, it is. It's exactly what it means. Look at 521. And tell me what it says. It says, as people sinned more and more, God's grace became more abundant. Yes, he will show more grace the more that you sin. But, listen, this goes back to what we just said. But love says, Kelly, 
Yeah, I'll forgive you if you sin a million times. But I love you, and you love me. Don't do that. Don't take advantage of me. Yes, his sin will, in, his, his sin, no, sorry. His grace will increase the more that you sin. The more sins to forgive, the more you need. But love says, don't do that to me. Like, it's not a letter of the law. Don't sleep with her. No, it's, Trip. do you love me? Yes. Then don't do that. Okay, I love you. I don't want to do that. Do we need to talk about Jimmy's Jeep again? Okay. So that's the point, is if you love, he says, the ones who love me are the ones who keep my commands. If you love me, keep my commands. Not by the letter of the law. You will tithe. You will go to church. You will wear your Sunday best. No. Do you love me? Yes. Wear some clothes. Thank you. Love says, I want to honor you. Love says, I want to act with thanksgiving and serve with gratitude. So maybe I'm not held to the letter of the law anymore, right? But if the law of God, if his precepts and his commands and his statutes, whatever the Bible wants to call it, if this is displaying God's heart and his standard, if I love him, wouldn't I want to do it? Not because he's a mean Zeus thunderbolt thrower, but because he loves me. And so out of love, I don't want to do that stuff anymore. I'm living that now. I'm living that now. When this happens, this is where true heart change takes place. Where love rules where rules don't rule. Rules ruling stinks. Where love rules, that's true Christianity. When the gospel of God's love just begins to saturate you and permeate your heart and, and reaches into those, those little black chambers of your heart that, that just need his love and it invades those sections and you're pondering his love, that's when true change comes in a person. Not because I'm telling you, you better put some money in the box. See, that doesn't fly, does it? Who wants to give in that church? You better come to Sunday school. I used to do that when I used to go to another church. They just hound you for Sunday school. I think there was a bonus if they had a certain amount of attenders in their class. And they just make you go, man. And I just, I don't get that. I don't, I don't do so well when people tell me what to do. Hmm. <laughs> Go figure. Grace and love have to go together. Yes, his grace saved you because you didn't deserve it. You didn't ask for it. You didn't earn it, but he saves you anyway. You know what grace really is? It's just a display of his love. It's God's love for you separated from your love for him. It has nothing to do with your love for him. It's completely about his love for you. And so when he gives you, shows you that love, your response is love as well. But hyper grace, hyper, hyper, hyper grace, that's abuse. And that's what you see rampant across the Christian landscape. Hyper grace, and that is abuse of what God has done. That is taking advantage. When God, when God says, if you love me, don't do that to me. If you love me, honor me. And abusing that love, knowing that the, when I sin, he's going to forgive me, that's abusing. That's exploiting somebody. That's being mean. That's being mean. If I tell you that you can take advantage of me, and you do, you're mean. True, right? And that's exactly what's going on here. Now, here's another issue that we have to talk about. You've got to do something with this thing, because I think a lot of people struggle with this big time. And it's about sin. If sin is dead, if, if Jesus has killed the power of sin and sin is dead and it no longer has any power over me and I'm no longer a slave to it, then why do I still do it? Anyone ever think about that? Anybody? Two people in the whole, three people, four or five. Okay, I've thought about that. I've thought about that and, and, and I'll tell you what. There are times, if we're going to, let's, uh, we'll start from the pulpit. We've got to be honest. There are times in my Christian life, 
that I have doubted the existence of Jesus and his power because I don't understand why I still do this stuff. Now, I read this Bible, and it says that sin has no control over me and that it is dead. And he went to the grave, you know, and he conquered sin and death, and it's no longer my master. Okay, why am I still cussing then? I mean, is, is it, is, what's going on here? I mean, if it, I mean I've been, has anyone else ever been here? Am I the only one who, I mean, a healthy dose of doubt, right? Let's be honest. That's me. I, 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 I often don't believe in God. I mean, let's just be honest, right? I don't understand because it, there's a claim, and it's not living out in my life, and so I start doubting the very existence of God. The reason why is because I don't have a clear understanding of who God is and what his gospel actually says, and when I have a clear understanding, as I think I do now, I think, I think, I think, <laughs> I think I'll have a better understanding when things start to go bad. Why? It's not that Jesus isn't, hasn't done what he says he's going to do. He hasn't, it's not that he failed to do what he claimed. I think there's more to it than that. And this is also a place where the, the, the church will divide. Look at verse um, 11 through, four, through 14. Let me take a drink here. 11 through 14, so this is what we're talking about. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Like, that's awesome. Like, hoorah, right? Woo! I'm not going to mess up anymore. I know sin leads to bad things. It's like drinking battery acid. I know it's not going to work out for me. And so I don't, I don't have to worry about it anymore. I'm good. I'm not going to sin anymore. The sin is dead. I have died, 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 died. My old self was crucified. Let's just read on here. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument for, of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Still confused. So God doesn't sprinkle fairy dust on the sin and make it go away? Because when I'm reading this, it kind of says that. I mean, maybe not the fairy dust. Maybe, I, don't, I didn't see Tinkerbell in there. You know, in every Thomas Kincaid picture of Disney, Tinkerbell's in it. Do you know that? I don't see Tinkerbell in this chapter. I don't see it, but I kind of read this, and I'm going, man, it's totally dead. Like, sin, Jesus Christ said, okay, sin, no more. You have no more power over Pete. You have no more power over Charles. You, you can't. So you got no say in their life. And so now the logical thing for me is that God is absolutely, another church term, sovereign, and he, another thing, churchy, he's in control, and he killed sin, so I won't sin anymore, but crap. I keep sinning, like I don't, so I'm lost. It's, 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 uh, it's lost on me. I don't know what to do, and so there's, there's these camps that set up, these, these divisions in the church, these different tribes that set up, and some of them are going that God is in total control, and you're just like a, a puppet and a pawn in his game, and then some people over here going, no, you have free will, and you can make every choice yourself, and, and they fight over it. Here's my, this is just my take. You can do what you want with it. You've got a Bible, right? Everyone here have a Bible? Okay, so you're, you're on your own. Yeah, right, but I'm going to give you what I think. I think... That if you go to Gold's Gym and you walk in and you stand in the middle of that place and you go, health, <laughs> low blood pressure, clean veins, six pack, good luck. It's not going to work, right? It would be nice. That would be really nice. I might actually, perhaps, might go. <laughs> yeah. Okay, the weights and the treadmill and the elliptical and all these different things, they have the actual ability to make all those things happen, don't they? 
Yeah, but you gotta use them. See, the, you, you don't have the power in yourself to just go, six pack! Well, you could if it's a different six pack, but this six pack, you can't make it happen because you want it to. Because you will it to happen. No, you actually have to do a sit up. You actually can't have big muscular arms unless you actually pick up a weight. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? They kind of go hand in hand. It's a joint venture. The other night I was leaving here on, on Tuesday night, and I had my motorcycle, and I called mom and I said, I'm, I'm on my way home. I'm leaving. And I'm riding on my bike, and, I, and all of a sudden it was just like another illustration to me. It's like I, I told her that I was on my way home, but I'm not really, I don't have the ability. Like I could walk there, I get that, but I, I, I don't have the ability to just like transport myself home. Like my motorcycle has the motor and the brakes and it gets me where I'm going. Like the power's there, but I have to throw my leg up over it, right? I can't just go <laughs> click, 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 <laughs> like, like Dorothy, right? And go home. It would be nice. I think we're onto something here tonight. We can come up with some new stuff. But it doesn't happen that way, right? So I think that, that God's kind of like the motor and he says, I can get you there, but you've got to put your leg up over this motorcycle for me to take you there. God's like the gym. I got the weights. I've got the power to do it for you. But you have to come in and actually pick up the weight. Do you understand? God gives us some new desires in our heart. And he comes to you, and he, and he wakes you up to the reality of who he is. And he gives you some new desires, right? Because of his love, he gives you this. But I have to choose my master. Do you get this? It's not like, Trip, you will obey me. No, he comes up to you and says, Trip, I love you. I love you. I lo <laughs> no, not me. <laughs> no, I do love you. But he comes up and he says, Trip, I love you. And, and, and what his hope and desire is, is that you love him back and want to follow him and want to worship him. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Do you see the difference? Our task as believers is to cultivate our romance with God. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to choose to embrace this power and run with it. It's available to you, but you have to reach out, grab it, and go with it. We have to cultivate lots of things. Like your children, you, you might have thought you had something to do with creating them, and it may have been fun, but he is the creator, right? He created the child, but now he's asked you to cultivate the child, right? He wants you to teach the child about him. He wants you to help that kid understand how to, you know, maybe keep a checkbook and a budget and how to clean themselves and how to cook and how to worship God and who Jesus is. Like, that's our job. He creates. What do we do? We cultivate what he's given us. He's the creator of the, of the, of the fruits and the, and, the, and the vegetables. And I was like, you can't create your own vegetables. Like, you've got to get some of his seeds to begin with. But then once he creates this stuff, what do we do? We put it in the garden. We cultivate the garden. And we fertilize the garden. And we water the garden. And we, we pull the weeds out of the garden. He creates. We cultivate that thing. Our own salvation. Who does the saving? Is it our self? Have we earned it? Have we got it somehow on our own accord? No. He saves you, right? But yet the Bible says to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Get to the end of this thing. Get all of it. Working it out with me. Come on, let's joint venture. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, I think it's in Philippians chapter 1, that God has called you into a partnership with Jesus, his son. Same holds true for a business. Wouldn't it be nice, that same thing with the gym? <sighs> Physically fit, I'm gonna look just perfect, and it just happens, right? Oh, that'd be so nice. So you like, you start this business, right? Pete, wouldn't that be great if you could do that? Man, God, just, you bring the customers, make sure they pay me on time, and would you please do me a favor, can you put the shingles on too? That would be awesome, wouldn't it? Yeah, it just doesn't work that way, does it? So like if he's kind and you get a business going and, 
and he's given you that grace and you've got that blessing, you still gotta cultivate the business, right? You gotta go after some, some new clients and you gotta do a good job and you gotta show up on time and you gotta use the right materials, right? You gotta cultivate the business. You can't just hope and pray that someone's just gonna come in and buy like crazy and you don't have to do anything. That'd be nice. It just doesn't work that way. Everything that God creates, he's asked you to cultivate it and make it even better. We are called to cultivate our romance with God. He loves us first. We love him back because real power comes when your love for Jesus, listen, this is important, the power to say no to sin when your love for Jesus exceeds your love for that sin. That's when it becomes easy to say no to sin. And if you're going to, it is exhausting to just stop sinning because, the, because God said so. Like, that's a great place to start. But until you'll take the time to cultivate your romance with Jesus, where you love him this much and your love for this sin is here, and it surpasses, right, this love for Jesus surpasses your love for this sin, that's when it's easy to say no to the sin. But look. It's not the letter of the law that did that. What was it? It's your love for him. It's always about your love for him. Philippians 1.27. Live a life worthy of the gospel. Live a life that is worthy of the gospel of the gospel. Now that could take on a whole lot of different meanings too. It should look like the gospel. That Jesus Christ looks at you. You offer nothing. He offers everything. Or maybe it's a, it means that it's a life that because of all that he's done for you, let's just kind of balance it out and, and I should have a life that reflects gratitude for, for what he's done. It could mean that too. I'll just tell you this. When the gospel saturates you, when it saturates you and you ponder God's great love for you, and I'm reminded of my inabilities to help myself, to save myself, to deliver myself from these big situations in life, and I'm refreshed often in pondering this gospel, and I'm refreshed by God's availability and willingness to help me, making gospel choices becomes much, much easier. Do you understand? It is our job to cultivate our romance with Jesus so our love for him exceeds our love for the sin that often holds us down. And so we read in the Bible that we're called to be holy and we're united with Jesus and we're not supposed to sin anymore. We're supposed to be pure. So that's what this section of Scripture is all about. Romans 6 is just saying, listen, this is what God's done. This is, what, this is what's available to you and this is what I've called you to. Are you doing it? Are, are you doing it? So when he says, hey, listen, is any part of your body being used as an instrument to do evil? Or are you using every single part of your body, not just your 10%, not just your hands, not just your eyes, not just your job, not just your relationship with your wife or husband, all of it. Is there any part of you that is being used, not for good, but for evil? That's what he's asking you. And that's when you have to start looking at yourself. And the only way to fix that is to ponder the gospel and to remember this great love that he's, he's poured down on you when you didn't deserve it and didn't ask for it. And when you start thinking about that, your heart swells for Jesus and all of a sudden making choices to honor him with every part of who you are becomes a lot easier. Psalm 37.4, I asked, um, I think you can put it up there, yeah. You see that? I asked some of the leaders here in the church on, um, I don't know what day it was, Thursday, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, I kind of text messaged out to some of the guys here in the church, this verse here, to delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And we, so we kind of pondered that because I think that's the solution here. I think the way to, to, to follow Jesus observe his commandments, and to choose to stop, stop sinning. If we talk about pondering the gospel and all this great love that he's had for you, I think this is the key right here. I think this is the key right here. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, please don't think that if you'll delight yourself in him and talk about how great he is and ponder the gospel of how he saved you when you didn't deserve it, that because you want a new Lamborghini, he's going to give it to you. That is not what that says. Okay, this is not a prosperity church. 
What this means is, is that as you take time in those quiet, contemplative places of remembering God's great love for you as displayed in the gospel of Jesus Christ, this God of all gods who is sinless and perfect and he's willing to lay down his life, he's sweating drops of blood out of the pores of his face and he's saying, Father, you can do everything that you want. Like anything is possible. Would you please not make me go through this, but your will, not my life. He is willing to lay down his life and be tortured, ridiculous torture, for you. He says he will endure the cross because of the joy set before him. He knows that someday he's going to be able to enjoy forever with you, and you're going to be able to enjoy forever with him. And because of that great joy, he loves you so much, he's willing to be tortured and die for you. When you start delighting yourself. And then when you start thinking about that your children are a gift from God and your wife is a treasure from God and your church family is a gift from God and the encouragement that everybody gives and the beautiful sunset and the amazing ocean and all these great things that he's brought into your life. If you have a, a job that provides, if you have a family that loves, if you have health that's even remotely decent, all of it is a gift from God. Like when you start delighting yourself in all that he's done, something happens inside of you. All that evil stuff that you wanted to do before, it starts getting tossed out. And he starts changing the way you are. Your heart, according to the scriptures, is, is deceitful and wicked. That's what's in there now. But when you start thinking about the gospel often, look what he does. He starts purging that yucky stuff out and starts replacing it with new desires. You all of a sudden want to start reading your Bible. You all of a sudden want to start serving people. You all of a sudden are not sh afraid anymore. You want to share the gospel with someone. All of a sudden, like the basket's coming. Up. <laughs> You're like, yeah, I get to give. I can open up my house to someone. I can feed someone. I can give of everything that I am to bless someone so they would know Jesus. Like, that's not normal, right? We t I lived the old guy. You guys all raised your hand. I just wanted to get drunk and have sex. That's what I wanted to do. Like, that's, that's not me anymore. I'm still, like, crazy passionate about whatever I'm doing, but now he's taken my affections and shifted it from all that to him, and I'm just like, go after this thing. What was that all about? Did I choose that? No. I would still enjoy drinking and smoking and cussing and running around. That's fun. He changed me. And the more I ponder what he's done for me, the more new desires. It's like a snowball effect, and I want to serve him more and give more and help more and love more and worship him more. I want to have church every day. That's what I want to do. Why? Is that normal? Who wants to do that? The, the empty seats should tell you. Right? Yeah. Two people. Right? The, the empty seats should tell you. That is not what people want to do. You know Why? Because they're not delighting themselves in the Lord. They're not taking time to cultivate the love and the romance that God has for them. And then when you're doing that, when you're cultivating the romance with your wife, what happens? You want to serve her more. You want to help her more. You want to kiss her more. You want to hug her more. All that stuff. Then you end up like me with 100 babies. <laughs> no, but seriously, right? That's what happens, right? So like, don't, don't over-spiritualize. It's the same thing with God. You spend time with God. And you reflect on what he's done for you and who he is for you and how much he loves you. Your heart changes. And all of a sudden, you want to do that pondering more. And when you ponder it more, you love him more. And when you love him more, he gives you more. And then more and more and more, and you love, love, love. And all of a sudden, you're just this crazy Jesus freak. That's what he's looking for for everybody in this room. That's what he wants. I have no idea where I left off. Okay, so... Here's the thing. There's, there's kind of two camps. I, oh, listen. I don't. What does what does delight the, what does delight yourself in the Lord mean? What do you? Can someone tell me what they think? What's that? Okay. Come on. Anyone else? Encourage your brothers and sisters. What is it? Huh? Okay. What else? Anyone? Chicken. Anyone? Excited to spend time with them. What? Spend time with him. Mm -hmm. Kelly reminded me of what it really means. It's this. Jesus loves me. <laughs> 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 
when you meet that girl the first time, right? And you go back to your buddies, like, dude, I met this chick. She's out looking. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. You go to a football game, you paint yourself up with paint, get half naked, and you're a Green Bay Packer fan, it's 40 below zero, and you're naked with green and yellow paint with a slice of cheese on your head. Right? For, for a team that if they, wore, if they scored a thousand points that week, it wouldn't matter to you at all. You wouldn't live an extra day, you wouldn't have an extra dollar in your wallet unless you gambled like a crazy freak and you're nuts. It wouldn't affect your life at all. And you know what? If they lose, it doesn't matter either, does it? Like they're Gator fans, they want them to win, but if they lose, are they still, they're here, right? No, 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 no harm, no foul, right? I mean, it's, it, once it goes beyond fun, then it's, it's bad, but we'll do that for, for, for a football, for Brett Favre, did Brett Favre ever lay down, did, did, did Tim Tebow ever lay down his life for you? Did, did Brett Favre ever go to the cross and accept the full wrath of your sin? Did he? Jesus did. When you start thinking about that, that's just, cra- not to steal Francis, Francis Chan's word, but that's crazy love. That's crazy love. And that changes who you are. So there's two camps, and, and a lot of people have told me that I need to, uh, you know, decide who, what camp I, I'm in, because there's this camp, and then you've got to tell them who you are so they know, you know, what you believe and all this stuff. The, the first camp is this grace camp that says that, you know what, God is in control of everything, and he's sovereign, and you can just do whatever you want. He'll fix everything. He forgives everything. He loves you no matter what. You've got an understanding between you and him. He knows how he made you. He knows my heart. Whatever, dude. And you can just do whatever you want because God will fix it because he forgives you. That's camp one. So that's over here. And then there's camp two over here that says, you know what? You're right. God is creator, and he gave you a brain. Use it. And everything's up to you. He's this God who created everything, and he said, awesome, this is very good. And then he took off over here to this side of the, of the universe, and you're here with a brain, and you can discern, and you have wisdom, and you have books, and you can read your Bible, and everything is up to you. You decide. No. Two opposite ends of the spectrum, but I think there's a third camp. And I'm in that camp. I'm in the third camp. God did give us a brain. He gave me a brain. And I used it constantly for evil. Just like Romans 1 says. That's what we all do. We don't respond to him properly. And I didn't respond to him properly either. But then he saved me. And he showed his great love to me. And and when I choose to ponder this great love often... When I ponder this great love often, he changes my heart. He changes my heart. And then based on who I am now, on that changed heart, I make another choice. And then I ponder his great love. And he changes my heart. And based on that new heart, I make a new choice. And so on and so forth. And it goes on forever. I found something interesting in scripture. I'm just about done. John 15 tells us, Jesus Christ says, that apart from me, you can do nothing. What does that mean? It's kind of like, you got some things that you can do, but if you don't have me as your source of strength and reason for doing it, like, you, you can't do it. I'm, the, I'm the, the, the weights. I'm the elliptical machine, right? But you've got to come to my gym, and you've got to use this stuff. Like, but he says, listen, if you don't come to the gym, you won't get fit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. However, Philippians 4.13 says that I can do all things through Christ, who strengthens me. Ooh. So it's like the same exact thing, opposite. But what is that? When I read this, I say, you know what? God's grace 
my choice. Oh, it's a joint venture, you mean. So I'm not just some puppet, and he's not just some ethereal thing in the sky. Like, we're in partnership together? Oh, maybe that's what it means that it's a glimpse of that someday I'm going to rule and reign with him? That I'm going to judge angels with him? That maybe we're called into a joint venture right now with him? That's what I think. I think Camp 3 is a joint venture. I don't think that we have nothing to do with it and he's totally in control. And I don't think that I have all control and he has nothing to do with it and give me a brain and use it with discernment. No. I think that we both have something to do with it. Now, I can't explain it all because I ain't him. I do know this, though, that I am prone to sin. I am prone to look at things I shouldn't want to look at. But it happens. And I used to be really bad at it. I was addicted to really nasty stuff. And sometimes I start thinking about it because what's happened is when you look at that stuff, it blazes it into your memory. And it doesn't go away. And when you start thinking about it, you start being tempted. But let me tell you, when I'm thinking about it, I start praying. And when I start praying and I ask God to help me, I mean, it's amazing how easy it is for me to choose not to look at it. It's a joint venture. I don't even understand how that works. But I know that when I'm weak and I start praying, I get strong. I don't get it. He gives me the ability and the power. I start thinking about the gospel. You start thinking, if you were, if you're getting ready to, put porn on your computer and you start thinking about Jesus Christ going to the cross to pay for your sin and absorbing the wrath of your sin upon himself, do you want to do bad? I mean, come on, right? You don't. So like, I don't even understand how that whole thing works, but his gospel gives me the power to choose not to do it. I I don't think there's an algebraic equation for it. It just is, right? Right? It just is. I am a slave of whatever I choose to follow. That's it. So we get back to that thing that I just love to talk about around here, and that is choice. You have the power to choose. But I'm not asking you to choose sin or not sin. I'm not asking you to choose anything except this. Would you, I'm challenging you this week, Revolution Church, If you're sick, revolutions means a a momentous and sudden shift in the status quo. If you're sick of this, I love you, Jesus, like Paul. I love the law of the Lord, but I can't stop breaking it. You there? I love Jesus. I I don't want to sin, but I keep doing it. Are we all in agreement here? Every one of us? This is how you fix it. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. He'll give you new desires. And those new desires will not be to do that sin you have anymore. And when you start delighting yourself in what he is and, who, and what he's done for you in the gospel of Christ, the fact that you are absolutely helpless, utterly helpless and he who does not need any help comes and wraps his arms around you and says, I love you, you drinking, swearing, gambling, in the gutter, prostitute, hooker, dancer, drug addict, jailbird. I love you anyway, and I would die again for you right now. You start pondering that stuff. That breaks the power of sin. That's what breaks the power of sin. An ongoing gospel every day in your life. That's what you need to be doing. Ponder his great love. Don't just receive it one time at the altar to get saved. Just as you accepted him, so walk in him. Amen? All right, the guys are going to come. We're going to give out communion. As they give it out, hold on to it. We're going to take it as a family together. But I'm going to ask you to join me in a moment of prayer before they hand out that stuff, okay? Awesome. As often, Lord, I don't know what to say. But I'm trusting in you that you'll me the the words to say. Lord, I don't don't know that there's 
anything other than that. We, we, we need to be reminded afresh every day of your great love. So, so Lord, here's, here's the thing. Like I've challenged this church to spend time pondering the gospel of love, the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the world will fight them and it will make them busy and it will distract them from that quiet moment of time where they can reflect on great love. And so what I'm by the power of your spirit that you would free up their schedule so that they time to reflect on your great love. That you would create environments for us all this coming week where, we, where it was conducive to us reflecting upon your great love. That you would fight for us. That you would put up some boundaries around us often this week where we could actually stop and ponder your great love. Remind us of our complete and utter depravity. Lord, I, I don't know if this is even the right thing to say and if it's wrong, please strike it from the record. But Lord, would you remind us of the things that we've done? Would you, would you remind us of the things that, that none of us would forgive of each other, but yet your love surpasses that? Your, your love is, 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 is amazing. Like you don't, you, you're, the, you're the father in the prodigal son story. When we take all that you've given and we blow it on, on prostitutes and, and overindulgence and just nasty party and we just abuse all the things that are beautiful that you've given us and we just destroy it and we just crap on it. And yet, you are the Father that soon as we turn around from that, you wrap your arms around us and say, I love you anyway. Would you remind us of that often? such great love that you have so shown us that you would send your son to die for us while we were still sinners. Oh, uh, we, we might perhaps lay down our life for the best person on earth but you willingly laid down your life for the worst people on earth. <laughs> Help us to ponder that great love. Help us to delight ourselves in you this week. Give us some margin in our lives to do that, please. Fight for us, Father. In Jesus' name.